The Bloodstained Stars, often referred to simply as the Sisters of Eve epic arc, is a fantastic piece of starting content for new and returning players, and can also be used by veteran players as probably one of the best ways to get up your standings with any of the four main empires. It's also extraordinarily easy to do if you know what you're doing and you're using the right kind of ships and the right kind of fit. It can be repeated every 90 days, so once you've completed it once, you can go back through it again 90 days later with different ships to try different things. I really like the Bloodstained Stars as an excellent way to test your skills as a new pilot and to see how you're getting on, but some people do struggle with it. In this video, I'm going to be showcasing how you can complete the Sisters of Eve epic arc really easily using ships that you can get very early on. Ahoy there folks, I'm Captain Benzie, and in this video I'm going to be talking about the Bloodstained Stars, the Sisters of Eve epic arc. We'll talk about what this is and why you should run it, and I'll give some sample ship fits that you can modify in order to complete this rather easily. Ultimately, most of the Sisters of Eve epic arc is pretty straightforward. There are some more complex missions that we'll talk about in a moment, but the second to last mission does provide a little bit of a roadblock to play if they're not entirely certain what they're doing, but we'll talk about that one later on. So if you are looking to find out how you fight Dagon, then do check the timestamps of this video listed down below. Otherwise, if you do enjoy this content or find it useful, it would really help me out if you could just hit like on the video, subscribe if you haven't already, but if you do want to go that extra mile to help support this channel and help keep me making content like this, you can do so by heading to my Patreon, which is linked down below. I have a PayPal tip jar, and I even have a wonderful Redbubble merchandise store which you can grab some exclusive swag at. Also, fantastic news, I've recently been accepted into the official EVE Online partner program. There's some really cool stuff going on there, and I'm looking forward to being able to better improve my content and to share with you, my community, some really cool bonuses for that. Anyway, all of that said and done, let's jump right in to talking about the Bloodstained Stars. First of all then, what even is the Bloodstained Stars, how do we access it, and why would you want to run it in the first place? Well, first of all, how to access it and actually run it. We're going to go over to the Agency here on the left hand side of the screen. Again, we can use the default keybind of Alt and M to open this up. And once it opens up, we've got all of this stuff here. We can go into Agents and Missions, and we're going to look at Epic Arcs. If we come into the Epic Arcs screen here, you'll see there's a whole load of different different epic arcs that you can choose from. A lot of these will be unavailable at different times. Here you can see the Bloodstained Stars. There I've completed it, 2023, um, March 12th. So it's going to be 90 days after I've completed that that this will come back. Once this is available, you just click on it, go set destination, and you fly to the first of the different agents here, Sister Altura. She will start this mission line off. And do be warned, it is long. There are seven chapters, and if we scroll down this list, you can see these are quite long chapters. There are quite a few missions um, to clear here. Some of them are straight up combat missions, some of them involve Involve you picking up items from somewhere and dropping them off somewhere else, so do read the missions carefully. It does also have some really interesting storyline and some lore connotations to it as well, so if that's your thing, it is well worth running it just for that. If only to see how the Sisters of Eve react to you, a Capsuleer, being pulled in to help them, because the Sisters of Eve are notoriously mm, hostile's the wrong word, but dubious of Capsuleers. They see Capsuleers as being incredibly dangerous and causing untold wanton destruction across the cluster, and since they are essentially a humanitarian service, that doesn't gel too easily with them. Ultimately though, the reason you'd run this starts off with A, it's fun and there's some really cool story implications, B, you do earn a good amount of isk for running this amongst some other bits and pieces coming in and out of it as well, and also once you start hitting the last couple of chapters, you are op given the opportunity of flying alongside any of the four main empires, the Kaldari, the Galente, the Amar, or the Minmatar, and whichever one of those you choose, upon completion of the whole epic arc, you earn a lot 
a lot of reputational standing with that faction. It's like 0.7, I think, somewhere around there. A lot of reputation gets earned with them. Very useful if you are otherwise not, you know, like having negative standings with someone because of factional warfare or whatever, and you're trying to pull those standings back up. Or like me, where I really wanted to get to the L3 agent missions very quickly so I could fly my hurricane, this was an incredibly quick and wet, easy way to do it, twinned with just rerunning the career agent missions in all three of the starting locations. Beyond this as well, it does actually twin really nicely into the air career program. If I open up the air career program and go into Enforcer, you'll see that there is an entire epic arc section here. Complete one epic arc mission, complete five, ten, twenty, and complete the entire epic arc. And this gives a lot of stuff. You get a lot of career points for these. The final one there is 50 career points, a load of ISK, some skill crates and things like that for going around all this as well. I mean, you can just check out how many career points alone this gives. Five for the first, 10 for the second, then 15 again. So that's now 30 that we've had by that point. Once we get around here, that's now 50. The 100 career points for doing the epic arc there. And that's just on its own. In addition to that, you're probably going to get some of the other bits here, like the combat ones of destroying so many enemy ships. These will really rack up quite quickly through doing that epic arc. The Soldier of Fortune has a few as well of killing 75 enemies with a frigate or destroyer or cruiser, depending on the kind of ship that you use for this. You can run it in a frigate. Some of the missions are a bit tough in standard Tech 1 frigates. We'll be looking at destroyers because it's a really easy thing to get into early on, but you can also run it in cruisers if you've got a decent enough fit for it. But again, I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself. We're still talking about the why you'd want to run this. So you're going to get a lot of goodies from the Air Career Agent program, you're going to get a load of ISK from the thing itself, a load of reputation, and it is just good fun. Do expect it to take about four hours if it's your first run through. About four, four and a half hours, I think, is what it took me the first time I went through. You can run it significantly faster afterwards once you've done it again um, and you kind of know what you're doing or you've got a much more powerful ship. I came back and did it on this character, for example, using a Tech 3 Destroyer, the Jackdaw, and that whole thing took me about two and a half hours from start to finish because everything died pretty much in one hit. Still useful, though, for that reputation gain. Anyway, so that's why you would fly it. Let's talk about how you fly it. The first fit I want to showcase for this is the Minmata Republic Thrasher, but the kind of concepts we're going to be talking about here will also work with the Kaldari State Cormorant, the Galente Federation Catalyst, and the Amar Empire's Coercer. Essentially, these are really cheap destroyers that you'll get actually as part of the career agent missions that you do early on, so if you've done the career agent missions, you should already have one of those hulls, and then you just fit it like this one with the same principles in mind, which I will talk about as we go through this. This means that the rather cheap 3.2 million isk down here is actually slightly misleading because a lot of that you'll have already paid for on account of you already owning the hull. It's only the modules you've got to buy, not the hull itself. Now, for the majority of this epic arc, we're going to be fitting for range, using long-range turrets to snipe at foes from a distance. There are quite a few of the encounters and missions that you'll be doing out there that have large clouds of enemies in them, and if you go in guns blazing with short-range stuff, you're just going to get swamped and ripped to shreds. Whereas if you sit at range, you can pick the targets off one by one as they slowly drift towards you and as you lead them away from the rest of the pack. This is called kiting. It's a very powerful tactic and the fact that you can learn this so easily so early on, I honestly think is a really beneficial way of running it as well. This means for the high slots here, I have gone for 250mm light scout artillery. Nice and cheap, easy to get hold of. Seven of these in the high slots gives us a good whack of damage, a lot of damage per shot, with a fairly long reload timer, admittedly. From there, we then have a, a really good range on this. You can see 21 kilometers of fall off, optimal range out to just over nine kilometers with the skills that I have. Might be a bit shorter for you, but you're looking at some good range there. You can reliably hit targets here at a good 20 kilometers away, 30 kilometers away. The fact that the, this thing can only lock at 32 kilometers means that's basically where you're going to want to sit. Lock at 32 kilometers and then just shoot everything or whatever your maximum targeting range is. Lock, shoot, and just keep drifting away and everything will come towards you and you blap it on the way in. 
Now I'm using phased plasma S here, but you will need to carry things like some EMP, some fusion, just to mix up the damage types. Now phase plasma, you can see it's doing thermal and kinetic damage. That's really good against Galente or Kaldari rats, but you may want to swap to EMP if you're going up against Amarian rats or to fusion if you want to go up against uh, like Angel Cartel rats because those are weak to explosive. You just swap the ammunition as required. Now ultimately that's where we start, but the second to last mission in this uh, entire epic arc, it goes up against a guy called Dagon. Now Dagon hits pretty hard, he has uh, a very powerful ship that can repair a lot of incoming damage. Now ultimately we want to get close to Dagon, orbit nice and tightly so that he can't hit us, his guns can't track us fast enough, but that means our guns are going to struggle as well, and also the DPS that we can put out just isn't as good as it could be. So when it comes to that mission, you swap your long range turrets for your short ones. For the Thrasher, that's going down to auto cannons. So if you're using a Coercer, at this point you want to start with beam lasers for the most part, then swap to pulse lasers for Dagon. If you're using the Catalyst or the Cormorant, you want to start off with the rail guns at first, rail guns for range, and then when it comes to fighting Dagon, swap those out for blasters. If you can fit the rail guns or the beam lasers, um, then you will be able to fit the shorter range versions as well as those have lesser fitting requirements. Same with obviously artillery here on the Thrasher, swapping that out for auto cannons once we reach Dagon. For the mid slots, we want a bit of ability to move. So, a one Mega Newton YS8 compact afterburner, standard one Mega Newton afterburner will do, just not the civilian one. I see a lot of people still trying to run these missions using the civilian gear they got during the uh, career, ma uh, career agent missions. Get rid of those, just spend a bit of ISK. Buying even just an afterburner one is so much better than a civilian. But if you can afford to go up to something like one of these, it's just that little bit better and it will help you out by allowing you to control your range a bit better. We then under tank a multi-spectrum shield hardener. Again, I've gone for a compact, but if you can only afford a standard multi-spectrum shield hardener one, go for it. It'll get the job done. And for a, a small shield booster, I've gone for a clarity ward enduring because it's a little bit kinder um, and a little bit more powerful. But for the most part, again, a small shield booster one will get the job done with one sort of condition here. If you're going to go for a standard shield booster one or an armor repairer one, if you're using the catalyst or the coercer, um, I would swap some of your mid slots, but we'll talk about that when we get to that point. Essentially, what you want in your mid slots is, first of all, some propulsion. I would recommend a one mega newton afterburner to start with, then fill out your tank. If it is a shield tank ship, so the Cormorant or the Thrasher, then you're going to use multi-spectrum shield hardeners and a shield booster. If it is an armor tank, then these can be a little bit more open and we can put some other bits and pieces in here as well. Ultimately, those ships do have fewer mid slots, but you could look at something like a web in case something gets a bit closer or a target painter to help you get more concise hits off against your target. It's, it's kind of up to you. For the low slots though, this is normally where on the shield ships you're going to go for your damage modifiers. So here I've gone for a gyro stabilizer, this increases our damage done, and a tracking enhancer which increases the range of our weapons whilst also helping them track just that little bit better. For the, for the thrasher I do recommend going for a tracking enhancer and a gyro stabilizer when you are lower skills. You can try two gyro stabilizers, but if you are struggling to hit anything, swap one of the gyro the second gyro stabilizer for two tracking enhancers. Another way you can do it there. When this comes to the uh, with the cormorant or the catalyst, your damage modifier there is not a gyro stabilizer anymore. It's now a magnetic field stabilizer. You use that to increase your uh, damage done. It should be noted, however, the coercer and the uh, and the, uh, the Coercer and the Catalyst, couldn't think of it there, are both usually armor tank ships, which means the low slots are going to be things like armor repairers, um, armor hardeners, and plates and things like that that are gonna help you tank there. So essentially, when it comes to fitting one of these ships, long range weapons to start with, then fit a propulsion module so that you can move around a bit faster, then fit tank. 
tank is your absolute priority, whether that's shield tank or armor tank, depending on the ship you're flying, that's your priority. Once you know you can survive the fights, then you start swapping your tank out for other things like damage modifiers, gyro stabilizers for the thrasher, magnetic field stabilizers for the, coerc for the catalyst and the cormorant, and for the coercer, the damage module there is a heat sink. So bear that in mind. Here you can see we've got a pretty good DPS here of 101 DPS. It's a lot of damage there. Instant shot of 1055 Alpha Strike. That's a lot of damage, but these have a long cycle time between shots. Ultimately, we've got pretty okay resistances, reduces the damage we're going to take, decent enough shields that are going to help us survive some of this, and of course we can repair those shields as we take damage, but we shouldn't be taking that much because we're sitting at range. For the rigs on this then, I've gone for a small projectile collision accelerator, again obviously if you're in the coercer that'll be a small energy collision accelerator, and if you're in a catalyst or a cormorant that'll be a small hybrid collision accelerator, and then tank for the other two. Here I've gone for a small EM shield reinforcer and a small thermal shield reinforcer because when you first fit the Thrasher, you'll see that the two shield resistances here are very, very low. Thus, we put those in to just plug those holes and pull those numbers up a bit. Essentially, if you're running the Coercer, the Catalyst or the Cormorant, once you've fitted everything else around the sides and you're now starting to look at the rigs, you've put your weapon rig in, you're now looking for your resistance rigs, just see for the Cormorant at the cormorant which of these two are the lowest and by those if it's the catalyst or the coercer it's going to be your armor resistances that you're paying attention to so again look for the, sh the, the smallest percentage on your armor resistances and buy armor resistance rigs to fit in those two slots there and pull those up thus reducing the overall damage you take Final points just to reiterate, this will quite comfortably run every single mission that that SOE epic arc can throw at you, with the exception of Dagon. When it comes to Dagon, you want to swap off the long range turrets, so uh, out goes the artillery, out goes the railguns, out goes the beam lasers, and instead we're going to look at pulse lasers, or uh, blasters for the cormorant and catalyst, or auto cannons here for the thrasher, and that should see you through. The second fit that I'm going to showcase is using a Corax, but this does kind of work if you were looking at something like a Talwar instead. Basically, I just wanted to give a missile option as well as a turret option. The Corax is a very popular destroyer with new players, specifically those of the Kaldari state, but even as a Mimitar pilot I was flying these very early due to the Kaldari destroyer skills being very quick and easy to reach, and it being a surprisingly potent and powerful destroyer. Now, if we have a look at the fit here, this is all alpha friendly, this is very, very cheap, you can see 2.2 million isk, very cheap fit to run with, and it will do everything except for the Dagon mission, but we'll talk about that in just a moment, because it's a very minor shift around. Now, for the high slots, I've gone for light missile launches, because I think range makes this entire SOE arc much more simple to do, much more straightforward. So we are looking here at some Arbalest compact light missile launches. You can see these have a range of 55 kilometers using standard light missile ammunition. And I do recommend carrying probably a few thousand Infernos, Mjolnirs, Scourge, and ja uh, not Javelins, and Novas as well. Carry a, a whole load of these. You can stock up as you go around. Like if you're a, when, once you start hitting the Minmatar section of the SOE arc, you do actually end up literally like two jumps away from heck. Perfect opportunity to restock a load of stuff there, but try and carry a load of ammunition with you to save you having to sort of jump back and forward on this. I've just gone for Inferno because they were what's in, but obviously choose whichever type of light missile your target has a vulnerability vulnerability to and you can do that by right clicking on the target um, and going to show info and have a look at their resistances you want the one that has the lowest resistances across the board then aim for that damage type now, ultimately, again, yes, I said, this gives us a 55 kilometer, um, 55 kilometer range, doing a whopping 839 hit points worth of damage per cycle. Obviously, these are quite slow cycles, 96.3 DPS overall because of those long 
like reload times basically. Now that is going to be enough damage to deal with everything up until Dagon. When you get to the fight with Dagon I strongly recommend swapping those light missiles instead for rockets getting into brawling range and orbiting Dagon basically as close as possible and just hitting him with rockets. Ultimately all that means is that you swap the compact arbalests for compact rocket launchers, just what, whichever rocket launchers you can grab off the market, a full brace of seven of those and go ham. For the mid slots, we need some survivability here. We're starting off with a one mega newton afterburner. I've gone for a mono propellant enduring, but you can get away with just a standard afterburner one if it's nice and cheap. It's something that allows us to move just a little bit faster, allows us to keep range. Remember, we've got a 55 kilometer range on our targets. Now our actual targeting range is only 54 kilometers. So we want the enemies to be around 50K away. Once they're 50K, we can start shooting at them, launching those missiles and wrecking them. If anything starts getting close, you can use keep at range and just pull to that same 50 kilometer distance um, using your afterburner to maintain that range quite nicely. In addition to this, because we're going to be at range, we have a target painter. You will need to train the target painter skill just to level one for this one, nice and easy. What this is going to do is essentially increase the signature radius of the ship that you are targeting, um, and a bigger signature radius means that your missiles actually apply their damage better. It's not going to increase your damage, you're never going to go above what you see here, your paper DPS, but it is going to make it more reliable that you're actually doing this much damage. Then for some tank and survivability, a multi-spectrum shield hardener, you can go for just a standard multi-spectrum shield hardener one. I went for a compact here, again, nice and cheap on the market. I did have one lying around though. This increases your shield resistances, means you take less damage from everything pretty much. And then finally, a, a small shield booster. Here again, a clarity ward enduring, slightly better than the standard shield booster one, but a shield booster one will do the job quite nicely. Just again, 2.2 million-esque, blooming cheap fit, and it's just a little bit better than going with the standard tech one stuff you know and you're probably going to use this ship a little bit afterwards as well for the low slots, Ballistic Control System increases our damage, and a damage control reduces the amount of damage that we take by increasing all of our resistances across the board. Pretty nifty bit of gear. Finally then, for the rig slots, because this is a Kaldari ship, we have fairly low electromagnetic and thermal re resistances by standard, therefore a small EM shield reinforcer and a small thermal shield reinforcer help pull those resistances up, and then finally a small bay loading accelerator just helps us launch a bit more frequently. But this will more than comfortably do every single mission that you need to do through this entire arc. Again, just swap from light missiles to rockets when it comes to fighting Dagon. And there we have it, everything you need to get done with the Bloodstained Stars, the Sisters of Eve epic arc. Ultimately, I'm not going to sit here and show you how to do this. This is an epic arc that is essentially designed for newer players to help teach them how the game works. You've done the career agents, now this epic arc is kind of like your test. A long test, admittedly, but one that you get to play around with. If you want to try something, give it a go. The worst that can happen is you lose the ship, you just buy another one and go back. Just obviously take it careful so you don't blow up every ship you have and end up broke, but Take your time, play around with different ideas. It's a learning experience and an opportunity for growth for you. I've shown you how to fit a Thrasher. I've shown you how to fit a Corax. But if you wanted to use a Coercer, a Catalyst or a Cormorant instead of the Thrasher, you could do. If you wanted to use a Talwar from the Minmatar Republic or an Algos or a Dragoon and try some different types there, you absolutely can run with all of those. Those are all ships that will quite comfortably do this as long as you have a vague understanding of what you're doing. So just bear those usual fitting principles in mind. Fit the weapons that the, that the ship is skilled for and do not split them. There is no reason to have artillery and autocannons. All you're doing is creating a ship that is not good at anything. When it comes to the drone ships like the Algos and the Dragoon, play around with those, figure out what drones you like. If you want to use the missile ships, the Talwar and the Corax, then learn how your missiles work, whether you're using long range ones or short range rockets. 
it's up to you to play around and figure out how to fly and how this all works. And I would love to hear from you all in the comment section down below how you get on with this. I've had so many great conversations with new players where I'm really interested to know how they handled this because it does throw up some really interesting scenarios against you, especially the fight against Dagon. I've kind of spoiled it now by telling you the easiest way to do it, but I've heard some really cool ideas from other people as well and I would love to hear how you get on. Let me know in the comment section down below or come find us on our Discord as well. The Catskull Discord has public channels that are open to everyone. We'd love to chat with you, hear how you're getting on with EVE Online, help out in any way we can. And if you're a bit of more of a professional player and you're just watching this video to support me, first of all, thank you. Secondly, come join the Catskull Discord as well. We've got a load of more veteran players as well, but, uh, both who enjoy helping new players and just chatting amongst each other and coming up with some really cool ideas as well. Anyway, folks, that is everything for today. I do hope this has been useful. Let me know. Otherwise, thanks for watching right the way through to the end. Happy sailing, and see you in New Eden.